You're not scared? Okay, wow. good. Got it. Yes, we're being live streamed. That's awesome. Woohoo. I'm just waiting for it to come up. Okay. Looks like it's going live. Well, hello, everyone. I am Michelle with Savvy Social Media, and I am here with Hillary. Now, is it Baggett? Baggett? It is Baggett. Okay, perfect. And today we're talking about writing your own permission slips. And I have to say, Hillary knows I've been doing this a lot lately <laughs> and honestly not feeling guilty about it. You have to take care of yourself first. Um, so today uh, we're going to be talking with Hillary, like I said, and she is from North Carolina, but now lives in Colorado Springs after 10 plus years living in Stuttgart, Germany. Oh my goodness. And Okinawa, Japan, U.S. Marine Corps family. Oh, very cool. She is a mother of a 21 year old and an 18 year old. Her profession is an occupational therapist for 26 years cranial sacral therapy thank you therapy for 17 and writer of hill talks uh, writer and hill talks podcast in community bloom which is what she, uh, her business is empowering midlife women she serves women who feel stuck isolated anxious overwhelmed <laughs> so they can find freedom in their health wellness and relationships in order to move onward in life and will begin to serve the women who are supporting other midlife women and communities as a collaborative effort. Now, fun fact about Hillary is she absolutely loves 80s videos, video games, and had the high score in Galaga in the Paris airport with dozens of people watching. Oh my goodness, you have to tell us more about that. She owns her own full-size stand-up 80s video game system. Stop it with 60 games. Oh my God, that even my niece is saying, oh my God. <laughs> I, I don't so cool. Tell us more about that. We'll start with the fun stuff. How did you get into video games in 80s? Why 80s? Well, that's my generation that tells you how old I am. And <laughs> well, it you was... look good, let me tell you. Oh, thank you. I could walk to or ride my bike to the arcade. And so it just cost a quarter. It was cheap fun. And I wasn't that good at it back then, but I loved it. And years ago, they sold like just a joystick game that you could plug into your TV but it's not the same. And I just had this dream and I thought, I'm going to give myself permission, speaking of permission slips, that I'm going to find the game. And I found a guy right here in Colorado. He builds them in his garage. He has his custom, you can decide rollerball for centipede, the joystick, where do you want your fire buttons if you're right or left-handed. He does the artwork. He was awesome. I tried them in three different states. I traveled, I talked to people as soon as I heard his voice. I'm like, oh, you're the one. You you know exactly. You know aspect ratio. You know the feel in the of the joystick. So that is so cool. Now, sixty games. How many? What kind? What's your favorite '80s video game then? Well, Miss Pac-Man. Miss Pac-Man is my go-to, and so all sixty of them. They're just on one machine now. What used to be, you oh. know, one game per machine. Now they can yeah. put it all onto just one. So. It's, I realize I'm probably a little bit alone in how much joy I get out of these 80s video games. But they happened to have one in the Paris airport when I was on my way to an anniversary trip. That's and beautiful. I told my husband, I'm going to go play. And I was rocking it. And then so many people are around me and I'm really good Galaga player. Yeah. That is so cool. I love, I love learning new things about people and something like that you never hear. So that's really cool. <laughs> So tell me how you got into your field. We'll talk about community bloom in a minute, but how did you get into your field? What did you like about it that wanted you to get into this field? Tell me more about that. So as an occupational therapist, you mean, or becoming an entrepreneur? Anything. Hmm. Yeah. How did you start your journey? Well, it started in high school. I loved art class mm -hmm. and my art teacher, and I was applying to college and he said, okay, what are you interested in? I said, well, I might go medical, but you know, I love art. He said, do the design thing first. So I went to design school after design school, graduated, realized I didn't want to sit at a desk. So mm -hmm. I went to wait tables in London, England, naturally. Right. Yeah. And one of my, one of the tables I was waiting on, they said, what do you like to do? I'm like, I like to teach. I like to help people. I like kind of the psychology of helping people move forward. I like service. And they said, you should be an occupational therapist. Our daughter's in OT school 
and she's got five job offers and she still has six months to go. Hmm. I came back from that trip. I started researching it, volunteering, got my OT degree, and it is a problem solving. It's just like design. There's the problem and you learn solutions, you set goals, and you work towards achieving them. So I evaluate and treat patients from birth, NICU, all the way through the lifespan. I think the oldest person I've ever worked with was 99. Mm -hmm. And we help them with their work, their play, and their self-care so that they have what motivates them, which a lot of the times I think people might be surprised, independence and being able to do things with family are usually the two greatest needs that we have. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't change through the lifespan. Kids want to be able to do things themselves. Adults want to. Yeah. So it was just about a year and a half ago, though, that I was doing my OT work and I tried a new job and it was not going well. Mm -hmm. And the brain fog of midlife and perimenopause. And I thought, oh, my gosh, is something is my brain broken? And I was having the toughest time because you're forgetting everything. We do. You know, because a little bit of background of me, I had breast cancer almost five years ago. And because of the chemo, I'm only 44, almost 45 in February. Now I'm going through that perimenopause is so young. And I'm like, oh my God, I think I'm going nuts. I can't remember things anymore. Yeah. I think what a lot of women don't even realize, Michelle, is that symptoms for peri can start certainly with any chemo treatments. But as early as 37, people that have not gone through cancer treatments are having these symptoms of brain fog, weight gain, mood changes, rage that comes out of nowhere, and no one knows about it. And kind of that's what brought me to where I am today was I thought I was losing my mind. Mm -hmm. I was really having challenges in my relationship. And I thought I was just going to lose my mind or just walk out on my family, Mm -hmm. which was not the goal. None of us want to say, this is what I want to do. And it got really dark. And women don't really talk about that sometimes that we think we're afraid. I can't like, there's go on a like stigma. this. Like if we do talk about it, people are going to look at us different, especially men. They're going to look at you different. They're not going to want to work with you. They're not going to want to do anything. It's true. And we just need to give women the permission slip to say, hey, this is the choice I made. And this is why I made it. And I'm still living, breathing, talking. I still have value. I still have worth. Mm-hmm. I can be savvy. I can learn new things with tech, with social media. And I became an entrepreneur out of this heart of service because what I went through, I had to have a major surgery, a major reconstruction, go through pelvic floor physical therapy. I didn't even know what it is and I'm a therapist. Mm. (laughs) And coming out of that, I thought, I don't want any woman to go through this alone. And so that's where my heart to serve, to teach, to help comes from. And so Community Bloom evolved out of that. Why Community Bloom? Why that name? I think my business partner at the time chose that name because, but it resonates with a lot of us because we feel sometimes as we're aging, like we're wilting. Mm. But what people don't realize and what I want women to just know is that your time is coming. You are about to turn the page to write either a new chapter or maybe even a new book because the confidence that is going to be rising out of you, finding that voice, giving yourself permission that we'll talk about in a minute Mm -hmm. is where it comes through. And there's joy on this other side. And so if women can feel the hope of going from a seed to a bud, to growing, to blooming Mm -hmm. and community bloom is the field of sunflowers is one of my images where we're spreading all of this light and joy and hope where sometimes it just isn't at the time because so much is going on. Our kids are either teenagers, they're leaving the nest, they're going to college Mm -hmm. or they're moving back home. It's a lot. So how do, what is your hope for women going through perimenopause or postmenopause? What are your hopes and how do you want to help them? I had this new dream since the last time you and I talked, and it's to create this women's midlife network Mm. where women, no matter what they're going through, they can come to the site and see, oh, I have some medical questions. Oh, I need some natural alternatives because I'm a natural holistic person. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need to know 
who I can go to, who can I trust, because there's overwhelming, too much information, and it's not great. So, I mean, I've been working on, I've got some workshops that I write on Perry, what's happening to me, and pre and post hysterectomy, because I had a friend call me and said, I think I'm about to go through what you're going through. Can you talk me through a few steps? Mm. And then I realized, well, this is exactly the course I would create or workshop to help so many other women. All to know that things just fall into place, especially when you're not even looking for it. It just happens. Yeah. And I think it's awesome. Yeah. So why permission slips? What do we need permission slips for in our life? Mm. Why that name? How do we have permission? I'll go get into permission slips. Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a little girl, you had to have a permission slip to go on the field trip. You Mm -hmm. had to have a hall pass. Yep. The teacher, I went to Catholic school. They were very well, strict. too. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. And we we had to get that permission to either, you know, even go to the bathroom. You had to raise your hand to request permission to speak, right? It was very strict. And I think in midlife, sometimes we are waiting for somebody to give us that permission. And it's some of these old messages that we carry on from before. And in our military life, I mean, you had to get permission, you had to get orders in order to move. You had to get orders in order to go to the next job. And I think sometimes as women and wives, we hold on to these thoughts and beliefs that we've just got to wait until someone says you have permission. So I've got like five quick ones that I'll go over. And the first one is say no. I think a lot of women... And I would say this to my 21 year old daughter. I would say this to your niece in the background. It is okay to say no, because the way things were always done for a long time ago, and we as midlife women, and whether we are single or married or divorced or widowed, we don't have to keep doing things the same way. We can say, nope, I don't wanna do that. The second one is we can say, whoa, wait a minute. And it's whether the, hey, I need to think about that before we commit to saying yes to the job, the volunteer position, the taking someone's, you know, kids for a week. You might just need a minute to see, is this the best solution? Permission even in that to have a crisis of faith. When I interviewed one of our pastors, she said, I'm a pastor. I had a crisis of faith. I said, can you tell me more about that? I don't think we know we have permission to doubt and ask questions. Especially in that profession. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to believe with what you're teaching, but if you don't, you're afraid to say, I don't believe this right this moment. It's right. And sometimes our faith and our belief systems will change and grow and evolve. And some people become more close-minded with age and some people become more open-minded and like, wait, I used to always think like this, but now I'm considering something different. Hmm. I think some women just in midlife need to know that they might need some silence, some solitude, serenity, or support. You know, it, do you just need to go out and get some sunshine on your face, some time to breathe, some time to walk on the beach or just be in the trees. Mm -hmm. And we don't give ourselves permission to take time for ourselves. And like I said, I've been trying to do that more. So Unfortunately, I've had to cancel a few of my interviews the past couple of months because I have been going through something. Um, And you always feel guilty when you have to cancel. And I did when I canceled with you and the other two and rescheduled. I shouldn't say canceled, rescheduled. That's right. We just always feel guilty. So how do you get, I know we didn't finish permission slips, but how do you not feel guilty all the time? What are your tips on that? If you have any. Oh, well, absolutely. I've definitely struggled with that. You're not alone. I mean, I have really felt it's kind of this like shame that we bury of like, if I am not giving everyone everything they need and pleasing everyone, then I must be a failure. Mm. And that's just simply not true. And it's taking it of like, wait a minute, in the in the priority of life, the hierarchy of needs that we have deep in our psyche, we need to have safety, security, and a foundation of health. And honestly, if anything above that, which we have to have that foundation in order to reach out to serve others further up the hierarchy, and you have to have food and shelter, all those things. Okay. If we don't have our basic health, mental, physical, emotional, social, then 
we really need to be saying no to a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. We're saying, whoa, I need to really think about that. And actually it brings me right into the third permission slip, permission to, to let go. Yeah. Because releasing is the only way to move forward. Because if we're holding on to the guilt and it's like, wait a minute, why do I feel guilty? Because somehow I think that I'm more than human, that I've been given supernatural powers and that I don't need sleep or rest. You feel like you're letting people down and you're letting yourself down. Although I will tell you in our situation, I was lit up with pride that you said, Hillary, I need to reschedule. I didn't need a reason. I did not. Need I always feel like I have to give a reason because I want don't. people to think, well, she's rescheduling. Well, why is she just taking the day out? You know, you don't want people to think, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think the insecurity sometimes and the confidence challenges that come in this yeah. stage of life with anyone after age 37 can experience these perimenopausal anxiety and midlife crises type feelings. And just the truth is, the great thing about being on the other side of this is that there's maturity and there's grace and there's compassion. And I think we need a whole lot more of that in this world. A lot more. Oh, I agree. Especially nowadays with everything that's going on that is not good. You don't hear any more good news anymore in the world. That's why I can't watch the news because it's always so depressing. Well, they're trying to, you know, shock us into getting our attention and creating that anxiety. It's like that is no longer serving us. Mm -hmm. I really hope that there is a way to filter out all of the hype. And I loved when people talk about good news and good things that happen. And it's not that it's important to know what's happening in the world. But oh, of course, 50 years ago, we did not know every minute of every day, the sensationalized things. And I think that's why anxiety is on the rise. Yeah. Well, I definitely have anxiety. And like I told you, that's why I had to reschedule. Um, but my mom is going through um, Alzheimer's. And that time that I had to um, reschedule with you, she had forgotten who I was. And so my anxiety really took over. So, um, so how do you, I, I finally realized that it's something I can't change. And I think when you realize that, then you feel better about it. I know it's not going to change. I know it's not going to get better and I can't do anything to change it, but just still be with her. Mm. Um, but that's what was going on with me. And I appreciate everybody who was okay with rescheduling and who has been very supportive and stuff like that. So when you're going through something like that, uh, I'm sorry, my cat just came in. <laughs> I got cats, nieces, I got them all. Huh? When you're going through something like that, how do you give yourself permission to still live your life but still have those emotions. Because for me, it was all about the emotions and I didn't want to do anything else. So how do you try and do both or can you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You mean to get kind of unstuck from the emotions or to let yourself fully go through the emotion both to get to the maybe. other side? Both maybe. Well, I'm it took me a while to get to the other side. Absolutely. Well, giving yourself permission to grieve is one that I didn't have on my list for today, but it's a huge one. Because it is, it is grieving. Sometimes we're grieving the relationship. Mm -hmm. We're grieving the, you know, your mom knowing you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can feel that just through the screen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we grieve changes in our relationships with our children, with a partner, a spouse, a parent. And it's kind of pausing to say, whoa, wait a minute. I need a minute. Where do I notice that in my body? And this is the craniosacral somatoemotional release therapist in me. Where do I notice that feeling in my body when I think about it and I scan like I'm at a target and I'm holding the scanner? And then when I feel it, it's like, oh, wait, it's right there. What does that look like? What does mm -hmm. that feel like? What's the texture? Is there a color, shape? Is there a name? And for some people, they just name the emotion. They might assign another thing. Oh, I had lots of emotions that time. I was angry. I was sad. I was upset. I was just a ton of emotion. And I think because there were so many emotions, I didn't know how to handle it. 
Yeah. And when I get like that, I just shut down. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to go anywhere. Yeah. I don't want to get out of bed. Yeah. Um, but it just finally hit me one day when I realized I just, it's something I can't change, but it took me a while to get to that place. Well, I think what's really helpful is to know that the grieving process and depending on whose list you read, there's five to seven stages. Kubler-Ross mm-hmm. is one of the famous mm-hmm. ones. And once you realize that all those stages are part of it and mm-hmm. they don't go in sequential order. order yep. They don't go and- in and they, sometimes you're ping pong backing. You're like, well, I thought I made it through that stage. It's like, no, this is not a linear process. This is a motion. So it's more like a starburst and you're at the spoke and you might feel this one and come back and you might feel this one and come back. And sometimes it's all of them and you come back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when it's like, oh, wait, you know what? I need to grieve and it's messy and it's muddy and it's not a clear way to the other side. But if I give myself, sometimes I say, if it, if you need to set a timer and say, okay, I'm going to either write it down or I'm going to say it out loud to get it out of you and feel all those emotions. Mm -hmm. And when the timer goes off, it's like, did anything change? Do I feel lighter, freer in my body, in my mind? Do I feel calmer? Or do I need to find some professional help and guidance? Because there are now some of the therapists out there, they're professional grief counselors and guides. It's amazing. And I think with the past th- almost three years, we've all suffered grief in different ways. Oh my gosh. You're because so you're bad. grieving yes. being out. You were grieving being with people, being with your family. Because when COVID first hit, I didn't even go near my parents because we don't want to get each other sick. And there was just so much grief the past three years between deaths and everything. You just, we just lost so much. Yeah. And I think kids did too. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's so socialization of to, being with other kids. To validate that. In fact, one of the podcasts I'm about to release this week is on emotional alchemy. And it's riding the wave of the emotion mm-hmm. so that it can transform and that it doesn't stay stuck inside us. Mm. And so this amazing Canadian counselor, Brittany, and so I just got the editing tips back and it'll be released definitely by tomorrow. Oh, great. And she just, I'm so fortunate to get to talk to people that have different perspectives and wisdom to help people. And I think the next thing I would say on grief actually brings me to my fourth permission slip, go slow. Mm-hmm. Because society says, go, go fast, more, more, keep going. And it's like, whether it's an exercise routine, a grieving process, a relationship change or moving, we don't need to compare what we're experiencing to anyone else unless it's a threat to our own wellness, Mm -hmm. threat to ourselves or someone else. That's, that's, that's bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think when we work to accept ourselves of like, man, there's a lot to grieve. And in in midlife, anytime after 40, the experts call it midlife. And I think it's just life. I don't like that term midlife. I know a lot of people old and I don't feel old. I think it's just life. I think it's that you've come to a point of wisdom and there's some things that we're not willing to put up with anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have to. Yep. And so it's the, I can give myself permission that I've learned these things And I don't have to share them with everyone. I can choose who I want to talk to and who I don't want to talk to. Mm -hmm. But creating that space, because it brings me to my fifth permission slip. Permission to grow. A new direction. Mm -hmm. To start a new venture, become an entrepreneur. I never thought at 51, I would call myself an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I turned 52 on uh, Saturday. And you don't look it. (laughs) Just under. And, and that's the thing. I think, you know, I've, it's controversial. Some people are very opposed to my, my hair color. Oh no, I'm growing my grays. I don't care. That's right. I, I don't care. I embrace it. It's just part yep. of it. I'm going to embrace it. Yep. With, I when I have colored my hair, I still look about 30. And <laughs> so that's a, a blessing, but then people are very dismissive on age. Mm-hmm. But I think the the barrier I see in women is it's in our minds and we think, wait, I can't learn that new technology. I mean, I learned how to podcast, build a website, build an online community, do social media. I mean, scary things, but it wasn't. I think that's the way we were brought up because my mom 
she was a stay at home mom and she loved it though. She did work before, you know, she got married and had kids, but I think that's the way we were just all brought up, Yeah, you know, and the man does everything. I don't like that. (laughs) That's right. Women need to know you are a fully capable, competent, equal human being. I love that my son sees that I work. I, I, when he was younger, he didn't understand why I didn't leave and why I was always home with him and other kids had to stay after school because their parents worked. He's like, why don't you work in an office, mommy? And he said, you should be happy. I don't because we wouldn't have this extra time. I said, you know, people choose to do different things. Some work in an office, some work in a restaurant like my husband does, and some work from home. But I want him to see that you can do anything you want. I don't care if you're a boy or a girl, you could do anything you want as long as you worked for it. Yes. I'm excited for this next generation. I mean, if I said I wanted to become an opera singer, that's probably not going to happen, right? Yes. (laughs) But with, with the seed of a dream of when I was a little girl, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I had people say, girls aren't allowed to be astronauts. Girls aren't allowed to be astronauts. Yep. And women need to know you can pursue whatever dream you have. And especially women over 40, I'll say, need to know you can change your career. You can start a whole new business. You can do something completely different. And there are women out there who are just looking to rally around and support you. So I pivoted my whole membership. Instead of trying to serve every midlife woman out there, I was seeing all these women running their businesses and their fitness trainers and nutritionists and coaches. And I'm like, everybody's trying to reach their 100 to 300 people. What if we bring them all together and Mm -hmm. we work together and we create connection and say, hey, you know what? I can talk about you because I've met you. We have a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need some help on savvy social media, go see Michelle. Mm -hmm. And it's because we invested a little time into connecting. So when you were talking about the people around you and your tribe a minute ago, how did you, how do you find your tribe? How do you know they're the right person? Because I know I have found my tribe. I love the women that I have surrounded myself with. And a lot of them are women. There's a few men, but I, <laughs> she's laughing. But, um, I love my tribe and I know I can count on them yeah. any time of the day. And they're always there for me. And whether it's personal, professional, how did you find your tribe and what does that look like? Hmm. Well, I'm very happy for you that you found yours. I think some people, you know, we struggle and I oh, I was this- 44 and I just found my tribe, you know, yeah. the past couple of years. So, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. That's what I try and- to tell my son. He's like, mommy, I don't have many friends. And I'm like, that's okay. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. And I said, you know, I'm 44 and I only have a few core friends and I'm happy with that. Well, and that's all we can really sustain, honestly. Mm-hmm. And I was just listening to an expert talk about this of, what bonds us and it's it's deep friendships that are trusting Mm -hmm. and I started like I joined one organization and I thought okay I want to go do this and try this I'm like "Mm, some of those people might be in my tribe but not all of them Mm -hmm. well let me go try this and I'll meet with this group of women and maybe I'll try this and I'll, I'll try this oh wait that wasn't quite right or hey I loved this but it was only for this amount of time and I started reaching out and I did look on social media. I'm not a huge social media person, which is kind of a challenge these days. You kind of need to be savvy, right? I can help you anytime. (laughs) And I started noticing and I thought, wow, I really like what you're doing. And I would have these conversations and I invested in this big course on how to run a membership, how to create community in a positive way and how to share our stories that people can get to know us and Mm -hmm feel safe and, and be like vulnerable and to be vulnerable because I haven't talked about my father's friends don't watch us or family, but you know, he doesn't want me to be open about that on social media. Cause a lot of our friends and family are there and he'd rather just keep it private. They all know about it, but I've just been very vulnerable lately because that's a part of my story. It is. And, and that's I feel like people... I have to let it out or else it's still going to keep getting at me 
Yeah, when we show up as our authentic selves with our true voice, then people are attracted to that. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise people would say, look at Michelle. She knows everything about being savvy in social media. She's got her act together. She's taking care of her knee. She's juggling marriage <laughs> and parenting and being an aunt and taking care of mom. She's just got it all together. And I think we build up a facade with social media. And so I think the authenticity and vulnerability of like, hey, I was in a very dark place a year ago mm -hmm. and I'm glad I'm not there anymore. And there's hope for other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's trial and error. Sometimes it's finding communities online. Sometimes it's finding ones in your local community and area time zones. I mean, my community, we are across nine time zones for the 14 of us. And it's like, wow, that makes it a little complicated, but you can record things, you can watch a replay, you mm -hmm. can play it while you're out for a walk to exercise, to take care of yourself. And even on my walk today, you asked me earlier and I wanted to go back to that. Yeah. You said, how do you get those emotions out? So I was on my walk and I was talking on Marco Polo to a friend and I put it down and I thought, wait a minute, I just need to give myself time and space to feel that emotion. And the tears started coming out and I thought, wait a minute, I can give myself permission to stop and just let the tears flow. So yeah. I think it's important. I've done a lot of crying. <laughs> let's, let's say that. So let's talk about your business now. So how old is your business? Just a year? Well, I just relaunched uh, less than two weeks ago, August 1st. Awesome. Yeah, we, and people need to know, like I started, we started with the concept, you know, late September and our partnership dissolved by February, right after our first launch. And so I had to readjust things. And I think mm -hmm. there's such value in hearing, yeah, I had this idea and it just took off. No, there's, there's ups and there's downs and there's twists and there's turns and there's reinvention and learning. And then keep looking for those people that really resonate with you and help our voices come together, like those singing bowls where these sounds come together and then it makes this sound that's unlike any one of those voices individually. And so it's when we come together. And that led in right into my question. So when you get stuck, so when you were stuck in February, what were your feelings and how did you get through those emotions? And then what did you do to get unstuck? Wow. It was messy. Mm -hmm. Um, it was very messy and isolating and it felt like my head was spinning all the time. So what did I do? I reached out for help. I reached out to a couple of business consultants. That's probably when I reached out to you and started asking some questions. I'm like, okay, if I've got to do this and, and my partner thought, well, the business is just over. And I said, no, I, I will buy you out and I'll, I'll move forward. And it really all comes down to a choice. Mm-hmm. We have the choice to remain stuck mm -hmm. or we have the choice to move forward mm -hmm. and knowing that you have the choice and it's the, I could have given up on that, but when that seed is planted and that burning passion to help and it's serve other women. Passion about what you do. Yes. Yes. And not and everybody knows or recognizes that passion. Well, that's one of my gifts that I offer people is I help them find their superpower mm -hmm. of what really lights them up, what really energizes them. And sometimes it's so different. I, I couldn't even say the word, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I couldn't even say that three months ago. Hmm. It just didn't roll off the tongue. And now I can say, hey, I bring together women entrepreneurs. I have a whole group of them and we connect and collaborate and co-create. We're creating retreats and summits and workshops all to serve midlife women. Because what do midlife women want? A lot of times they wanna escape yeah. They want to figure out who they are. They need a retreat to, I need a space just to think. And, and to, to know that you're not alone, that other midlife women are going through the same thing. Absolutely. It's having the conversations that we should be alone. Having. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> no, hundred percent. We, you're not alone out there. Whatever you are going through, you are not alone and mm -hmm. you're going to feel alone. And you have to look at that and say, oh, that's a lie. I mean, that's that's what dis how discouragement and darkness and depression sets over us, that I'm the only one that feels like this. And it's just not true. You're not the only person going through having a, a mother with Alzheimer's. 
you are not the only person, you know, who is trying to juggle being a spouse and a parent and a daughter. And okay, they don't want me to say this on social media, but I need support. I need to know I'm not alone. And I think that's the strength actually comes out. People think vulnerability or showing emotion is a weakness, but it's actually a strength. I'm secure enough in who I am that I could cry with you. Other people that I don't even know could see it. Mm -hmm. And it's, but this is just who I am. I'm not trying to be someone else anymore because I was the worst people pleaser. I mean, not a worst. I was a really good people pleaser. Really good people pleaser, but the worst for yourself. And is, I still what struggle, did it do for still, you? Yeah. I still struggle with it. I, I do too. With my adult children and husband, I thought, why, why am I exhausting myself doing all this for you all? Maybe I just need to take some time to go do this. Yeah. yeah. I've told my son, you know, he's 11. I'm sure you see pictures of him online, but, um, you know, I said, sometimes mommy just needs time. And, you know, he didn't, he doesn't understand that. He's like, well, why do you need time? You're home all day. What do you do? You know, so, but he doesn't understand. So now I think I'm sure you saw my post, but I started exercising, which is just walking, which is fine for me. That is but, exercise. Take out just Michelle. Yes. You're I right. started walking. Yes, yeah, you did. I started walking. And if I miss a day, I'm okay with it. I don't put that pressure on anymore. I started doing my smoothies again. I started reading again. But I'm just taking more time. And that has helped me get through that anxiety of what I was going through. Exactly. So with work-life balance, mm -hmm. how do you do that? You got two grown kids, but for somebody who doesn't have grown kids, how, what does your work-life balance look like? Cause you still have to be there as a mom. You still have to be there as a wife. They, they both live here. Oh, still. okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, one, our college girl is taking the summer and a semester off and our child, our son is about to go to college, but not yet. It's time. <laughs> time. Uh, and, I know. Is my son 18 yet? No. <laughs> well, and I think Work-life balance is a little bit of a fallacy because we're not supposed to be in perfect balance, right? Mm -hmm. It's that there are certain times of the day that are self-care and that's not selfish. That's essential. Mm -hmm. I there are times we have to have time to have healthy food or our brain is not going to function or feel good. And so for me, at least I have my, I have my fat five. I work in fives because it works well and I have five fingers. So I'm very lucky. <laughs> and it's, I get up and for me, I choose to do some quiet time or read a devotion. I have to drink water. I have to hydrate. I have to get some movement, get my walk in. Mm -hmm. I have to get some nutrition in me. Usually includes a lot of vegetables. Can't do too much fruit anymore. Mm -hmm. And then I have to connect and help and support someone. Like that's part of my, that gives me energy. So and if, if you miss that, what happens to you? Because hmm. that was my next question about self-care, what you did. Well, there are days, I think it was just yesterday. I was still in my walking clothes and I'd knock on walking and it was like six o'clock at night. I'd picked up the dog from dental. I had done this and I'd done this. And I thought, wait a minute. Did I even drink water? No, because I'm really thirsty. And I didn't do them. And it did not go well. And I'm not patient with myself or with my family. And I thought, I just need to walk out of the room quietly and quietly close the door and go take care of some other things. Mm -hmm. Or go for the walk. It's never too late to do the walk. But I noticed for me in my rhythm that for me, first thing in the morning, yes. so if I know I have for me a nine o'clock in Colorado meeting, I need to be up at six or 6.30 so I yeah. can give myself that time to wake up, the time to get moving, the time to get myself together. My work day out of the office doesn't start until 11. My work day in the office, I'll probably spend an hour in the office around 10 to 11. And then that's when I'll start appointments. But I have that blocked off every day. And I know once my son goes to camp now or school in September, once he goes, I'm going to go walk. That's right. And so people can, like, I have this vision of building this little system that people can create the blocks. Like for mm -hmm. me, it's a magnet because I'm tactile. But for a lot of people, you can just do it on your calendar mm -hmm. and just put those blocks, put your five things. You yep. can move them around any way you want, yep. but they need to be your five things for a good day. And my husband actually asked me, he said, 
okay, wait, you had a good day. What, what was that? Help me understand. Yeah. Because if we give our spouse a, a credit, they want to know what makes a good day for us. They yeah. want to encourage us in that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, connecting with someone. And I can certainly go a day without connecting, but if I've gone a whole week and I haven't scheduled like a social visit or a, hey, how can I help and support you mm -hmm. appointment, then it's like, wow, I feel like I'm just kind of stuck in my brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think the balance, you know, and, and walking is exercise. I think women think, well, I'm not running marathons, so I must not be exercising. It's like, you know, actually, it's for a lot of people as they age, marathons are not a good thing. Too much exercise or cardio shuts the system down if you're not fueling and giving yourself that nutrition that we need. So, so how supportive, because I've had a very supportive husband and family, um, how supportive has your husband and family been starting this new journey of, of being an entrepreneur? Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Um, I'd say there's some level of support. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd say there's, they don't really understand what I do, mm -hmm. and they don't understand when I come in the office and I close the door and I've got all my stuff places. And even my son who lives here, and he said, "What do you do all day?" I said, "Well, would you like me to talk you through my day?" He said, well, you don't put anything on the calendar. I'm like, you don't want to see my work calendar. I am podcasting and editing and I'm writing and I'm organizing and I'm connecting with people and I'm supporting and helping and serving and growing. And I still do a little work as an occupational therapist. And I think that's a hard part. I think a lot of women entrepreneurs maybe aren't as fortunate as you to have that support. But support can look different for other people. I, I don't have that pressure that I have to earn the money in order to keep my home. Mm -hmm. So I'm very fortunate. So I have financial security. Um, yeah, that was a hard question. I definitely was experiencing the emotion there because yeah. I would love, I would love for my kids and my husband to be really proud of me mm -hmm. for getting so far out of my comfort zone. But I will say a win. The other day at dinner, my son did say, well, mom, you're the entrepreneur in the family. And that's the first time he's like really said that. Yeah, so. that's tough to Oh my God, it became Barbara Walters and made you cry. <laughs> that's the first time one of my interviews I made somebody cry. That's not good. No. <laughs> No, it is. It, 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 my husband has been supportive and he always wanted somebody, his spouse to stay home and take care of kids if we had more than one. So, but there were days when I first started and he's like, you've been home all day and nothing's done. So I think it's hard for them to realize that, okay, I can sit at a computer on a Sunday and just blog. I haven't done it in a long time, but I have slipped on that. But he's like, well, what'd you do all day? I'm like, I blog. He's like, that's it. So I think it's hard for them to see what goes into running your own business, especially nowadays, every business is almost online. Yeah. So they think, well, okay, why well, see, you know, I don't bring, I don't have a tangible, like you, a tangible product. Right. So what do you do all day? Yeah. So, well, yeah. we, we had to renegotiate the marriage contract yeah. and, <laughs> um, and I said, listen, I, I'm not stopping work at this time every day to go and spend an hour and a half in the kitchen. Yeah. So um, I'm going out to yoga. I'm going out to Pilates. I'm going out to bar class. I'm making sure that I'm getting physically out of the house once a day because it's very easy to be when you work at home, live at oh, home. Oh, very. Especially during COVID when we couldn't go anywhere. It was ridiculous. I couldn't wait. I'm a homebody. I love to be home. I don't care if I'm home all day sometimes. But during COVID, I couldn't wait to get out. Oh because my God, I couldn't wait to get out. Yeah, so away. let's see. Let's see what else here. Okay, so are you a type of person that needs that silence to recenter? Because I'm looking at all your notes here that you sent me. <laughs> I, sometimes I really do. Mm -hmm. I'm an ambivert. And so sometimes when I'm interviewing people, people are like, oh, you're naturally an extrovert. I'm like, well, 
I definitely get overloaded. I, I was fortunate to get to go serve on a, a medical mission trip in Peru in mm -hmm. June. And I was with people all the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I just need to go to my little bunk bed and put in earplugs or music and just kind of, you know, cocoon. Yeah, it's weird. My husband loves noise. He needs noise always around him. I like quiet. Yeah. And if I play music on my computer while I'm working, it's a very, very soft music. Yeah. I just like that quietness. And I, I don't know, you know, we, I didn't grow up with a lot of noise around me. It was just me and my brother and, you know, brother and sisters don't always get along. <laughs> now we do, but you know, I just, I've just always wanted quiet. Yeah. So, so what is one thing you have learned about yourself during this process? Being an entrepreneur and doing this all on your own now. Well, the biggest thing is realizing that we're not alone that there are other amazing people and women out there who are doing this, who are willing to answer questions, willing to offer support, willing to say, hey, I was there. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, don't compare yourself to these other people that I have anymore. been doing it for years and years and years. It's in one of my mentors says, your journey is your journey. Your business is your business. And if you, if you look at all those things, you're not going to get anything done. And so to bring it in and focus. And so I have to humble myself and ask for help. And that was part of my healing journey through the, the surgery and reconstruction. I had to ask for help. It's very and, hard to ask for help. I had to too, when I was going through chemo and my two surgeries. Yep. Right. Yep. It's very hard, but it's a superpower when we can recognize what we need ask for the help and receive the help. Mm -hmm. It's like it feeds the soul to tell us you are so not alone in any aspect. Your body, your mind, and your soul are not alone. And I think we're built for community. Mm -hmm. I am better when I have my tribe around me. I am. I feel more, I want to say myself because I feel myself all the time. I just feel more empowered and yeah. I don't know. Just different when I'm around my friends and my tribe. I'm still surprised sometimes some of the women that have come up to encourage me or to say, hey, how can I support you? Or, hey, do you want to just talk this out? I'm like, do you know what a gift that is for me to be able to talk it out? Because there's only so much talking out I can do uh, <laughs> to my family, right? And that's not fair to them. And when the partnership dissolved, my husband was very afraid. He said, mm -hmm. Who are you going to be talking to about all this? I said, uh, other people, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Not looking to, you know, because his brain is not my brain. And we don't need to expect other people to think like us or act like us or feel like us. Yeah. yeah. And it's finding those people. And it, it's a lot of brave. It's a lot of showing up in a whole lot of Zoom meetings and saying, hey, can I ask this question? It's not going to feel great. And the best advice I got, and that's what I'll tell you, is that someone said, when you feel anxious about something, is it that it's so important to you and to the world that it just has to get out there? So it feels so big and it feels scary, but it's so needed and so necessary. Hmm. So for people to walk through that fear of, you know, when I no longer have this person in my life or when this didn't go how I planned and because I did this launch, I had to stop overthinking it. And I thought, what's the worst that's going to happen? Someone's not going to send me a private message and say, yeah, I'm in. I, the number of women that joined me were double what I had hoped for. Mm. And I was human. I did it very imperfectly. And I sent them notes and said, hey, I'm so sorry. I think I sent you the wrong link. Or ah, I made a mistake on this. Or I closed the card on a Saturday don't close a card on a Saturday. People are hopefully doing things for themselves or yeah. their families. On a weekend, yeah. 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 So I imagine there are women out there who need to know that they have this passion inside them that they might not fully know. And they have permission to let that rise up and rise out of them. And mm -hmm. it might be giving to one person. It might be giving to a family, their own family. 
It might be giving to their town, their community. It might be something to the world. Sometimes we don't know and being okay with that. I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but I'm willing to be brave and go forward. And when you don't give yourself permission, how do you turn that around? If you're afraid to give yourself permission. You mean in my mind, what do I tell myself to change? How do you turn that around? Well, sometimes I then do turn to music that's going to motivate me. And I do movement because when we move, it changes our brain. Mm -hmm. And we were not meant to sit in a chair all day. And I'll put on some music that really, my daughter made a playlist for me for my birthday last year and I'll put it on. She calls it Mama's Fun Vibes. <laughs> I'll put it on and I'm like, yes, and I'll move around or I'll go outside and get some fresh air. And I'll really ask myself, I'm like, I, I'm holding myself back. Why am I holding myself back? Hmm. And it's like, what is the fear? Because that's usually what it is. The gifts are what hold us back. It's guilt, insecurity, fear, trauma, shame. Those are the, the unfortunate gifts that hold us back. And it's like, what am I afraid of? And it's like one of my mentors had said, think of it as an experiment. You're just going to try this. If it doesn't work, you just do something different. Because we put this big weight on our shoulders that we've got to get everything right the first time. Yes. And it has to be perfect and all of that. Yeah. Perfect really holds us back. Mm -hmm. And the self-compassion, I did a little bit of like Brene Brown's work and Kristen Neff, who's the self-compassion person. She wrote a book all about it. She has that quiz online. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize a year ago I was really lacking self-compassion. I was so mean to myself. I was so harsh. The way I talked to myself, I would never talk to another human being. Mm Mm-hmm. And I wasn't even aware of it until I really thought about it. And yeah, it's weird that you treat other people better than you treat yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, women out there, we need to change this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, you know, when they say it's better to give than to receive, it doesn't say you should only give and never receive. So we have to change that. Of mm-hmm. It is great to give and it is a blessing to receive. Mm. And I think people, the people, you asked me about my tribe, it's people that have a heart to serve midlife women. Those are the people we get each other. We get each other's struggles in midlife as entrepreneurs. We all have very different interests, but we have these huge hearts. And this was our doodle project I can share with your group. We, we did a connecting project and one of our members led us through creating connection through doodling. And she talked us through this and it was how to connect, to be honest, to be ourselves, to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I even wrote a permission slip, permission to show up, to cry and to share emotions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's perfect for today because I showed up and I cried. It was meant to be. (laughs) And I could find it in my mess. So that's always (laughs) fun. That's always fun. I see things happen for a reason, the way they're supposed to. So thank you for your gift and giving us permission to just be ourselves and be vulnerable because yeah, I haven't been very vulnerable with everything yet, but thank you so much for doing this. How can people reach out to you and connect with you? Well, you can reach me at Hillary at communitybloom.org. You can check out the website. The podcast is Hill Talks podcast. My name's Hillary. So I talk a lot and it's so that you know, you're not alone. And I've really shifted this whole last year has been going towards midlife, but it didn't hit me until this spring that last summer, that was the, that was the seed that was planted that I'm going to reach out to connect with these midlife women. And we have a mailing list. You can join that. Uh, I try to not send out too many emails. I try just once a month because I'm not a big, I don't like reading people's long emails, but I do sometimes like listening to podcasts that encourage me and, there's some amazing women out there, including you, Michelle. I'm so oh, grateful for you. you. I'm going to have to add you to my list because now that I do walk, instead of listening to music, I want to listen to podcasts. 
by oh, one. So I will have to add you to my list. Yeah. You know, Zig Ziglar used to say, um, he called it Automobile University when people commuted in their cars. I'm like, well, Zig, you got to update that. I mean, yeah. with us, but it's, you know, yeah, anytime you're walking or exercising, you can be learning something or, or just being encouraged. I mean, someone mm -hmm. that's just going to light you up and say, I see you and you're awesome and you can do this. I've been where you are, maybe not in every single way, but in so many ways, we as women understand each other. Oh, well, thank you so much. This was great. I'm glad we we're finally able to do it. And thank you for being so kind and generous with your time. And if you guys have any questions, make sure to comment below and Hillary and I will answer them. Yes. And then when it does um, post, just add all of your contact information in the comments that we people can reach out to. you. Sounds great. Thank you. And you taught me how to make my little Link list to make yeah. it easy. So yeah. yay, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See, you're passionate about helping people in your way. I'm passionate about helping people in my way. So <laughs> I love, I love it. it. I love yes, it. Thank I you. Love it. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to talking again soon. I appreciate you so much. What a joy. You just gave me energy and your kindness, your heart to serve women. And you know, we're both trying to serve in yeah, just in yeah. different ways. So I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And we'll talk again. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>